Forum. I'm Bobby Regan, Chair of the City Club's Forum Board. For more than 100 years, City Club of Portland is where civic-minded people have come to find solutions to our region's biggest challenges. Today, we're a diverse network of people who are eager to learn, connect, and share ideas for a better Oregon. Thank you for joining us at the Sentinel Hotel in downtown Portland, where thousands of people are joining us online, on the radio, and on TV. Live viewers are watching on KGW's website, Facebook feed, and news app. Our radio audience is listening via X-ray FM stations, 107.1 FM and 91.1 FM, and TV viewers will watch today's program via Open Signals community media television stations. We are incredibly grateful for the support of our media partners in bringing City Club forums to our community. In addition to City Club's valued media partners, our volunteers and staff enable us to put on Oregon's best civic programs week after week. A special thank you goes out to today's sponsors, Kaiser Permanente, J.D. Dunn Construction, and Wells Fargo. I'd also like to thank the civic scholars from Roosevelt High School for being here today. Please join me in showing our appreciation to everyone who has made this forum possible. Today, we're pleased to have with us Multnomah County Chair Deborah Kafori. Chair Kafori is a graduate of Grant High School here in Portland, go Generals, and earned a Bachelor of Arts in English from Whitman College. She returned to Portland to work on Portland Public School bond and levy campaigns, thank you very much, and to represent North and Northeast Portland in the Oregon House of Representatives. In 2008, voters elected Deborah to the Multnomah County Commissioner Commission, where she led efforts to replace the crumbling Selwood Bridge, helped stabilize county funding by working to find a permanent funding source for our libraries, and is currently working to replace the county's 100-year-old central courthouse. Deborah was elected Multnomah County Chair in 2014 and was re-elected for a second term by a 71% vote in 2018. Please join me in welcoming Multnomah County Chair Deborah Kafoy. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Deborah Kafoy, your Multnomah County Chair. And this microphone is doing some funky things. Oh, well. I am honored to be here with so many of you who care, as I do, so deeply about our community. I want to start our time together with a land acknowledgement. Jillian Joseph, a member of the Grovant People and Executive Director of the Native Wellness Institute, is a passionate advocate and a strong leader. Jalene has contributed to my own understanding of this place that I call home and of our shared history. I am honored to welcome Jalene to provide the land acknowledgement. Good afternoon. I want to thank you, Chair Kafori, and your awesome commissioners that are here for the invitation to offer this land acknowledgement. Portland and Greater Multnomah County are located on the traditional homelands of many tribal people, including but not limited to the Multnomah, Kaklamet, and Clackamas, which are bands of the present-day Chinook tribe, the Malala and Tualatin Kalapuya, which are two of the current-day 26 bands and tribes of the Confederate tribes of Grand Ronde, bands and tribes of the current-day Confederate tribes of Warm Springs, Cowlitz, and many other indigenous nations also made their home in seasonal camps along the Columbia, Willamette, Clackamas, and Sandy Rivers. Today, I acknowledge the people of these traditional tribal territories that we live, work, and play on, and bring their existence into this room, into our minds, and into our hearts. It is because of settler colonialism that these tribes have been erased from the riv riverbanks by forced removal and other acts of erasure, including genocide. 
Hundreds and thousands of other tribal people from across our nation were brought to Portland by various federal programs and continued efforts of our erasure. My grandmother and grandfather were welders in the shipyards during World War II and were brought here all the way from Montana. They returned to their homelands, but many Native families did not and are still living in this city today. For many Native people, we are thriving and contributing positively to Multnomah County, and we are always happy to share our awesomeness. And for many of our people, the lasting impacts and structures of colonialism continues to keep us erased. Thank you for this opportunity to speak the truth into this space and for listening to this act of reconciliation and healing. I hope that Multnomah County and each of you in this room continue to acknowledge the history of colonialism and to take action for positive change. Multnomah County will be a better place because of it. Today, I stand before you as a descendant of miracle survivors of genocide, and I acknowledge my sisters of color and my brothers of color in this room who also descend from miracle survivors of genocide and racism and oppression, and I welcome you to tribal lands. I also want to acknowledge the City Club of Portland and its leader, Julia Meyer. The City Club continues to evolve under Julia's leadership, as it well should, because standing still is not an option if we want our values to have meaning and not merely remain aspirational. As easy as it sounds, we know that it takes bold leadership. Thank you, Julia. Every spring, we get this opportunity to come together to take stock of the work of 6,000 amazing Multnomah County employees and to answer the question that my kids, my daughter Anna, and maybe some, even some of my neighbors ask, and that is, Mom, what does the county do? <laughs> where to begin? Seriously, downtown, where a hot job market and cranes crowding our skies have made it impossible for seniors to afford their apartments, or the Moda Center, where 19,000 people were exposed to measles on one night or in East County, where a third grader takes home meals for their whole family from a Sun School pantry. What the county does every day is to face the most complex and confounding problems of our time, the issues that chew people up, leave people behind, and have no easy solutions. These problems are not necessarily unique to Multnomah County, the Portland area, or any other region in the United States. But what's different about our issues and why I'm optimistic is the way that we're approaching them, guided by our values, our lived experiences, and a tireless dedication to do what's right. The very first board of county commissioners met not far from here. And as they set about building roads and infrastructure for this rough and tumble, relentlessly changing, impossibly beautiful place, one day they were presented with a man in need, a neighbor. He was homeless and suffering from severe mental illness. He had no one to care for him and no place to go. So 164 years ago this month, in April of 1855, the Multnomah County Commissioners paid for his lodging and his care, 63 cents a day. That is our history. That is our mission, and that is why I am here. To stand at the intersection of service and justice and face seemingly impossible challenges head on. Right now, we are facing a crisis that affects everyone on our planet, climate change. In the time I've served on the Multnomah County Board, we've had record-breaking wildfires that have threatened our property, air quality that threatens our health, and early snowmelt that threatens our water quality. Scientists tell us that we have 12 years to dramatically cut emissions before the worst impacts of climate change have settled in. My daughter Anna just turned 13, and I can tell you those years have passed in a flash. The Trump administration wants us to believe that there is either nothing we can do or nothing to worry about. 
not true and not true. We can do something about climate change, and in Multnomah County, we have. We adopted the Climate Action Plan with the City of Portland so that while carbon emissions in Oregon have gone up more than 10% since 1990, in Multnomah County, despite all the growth we've had, emissions have gone down 21%. Last April, we committed to 100% renewable energy by 2050. And in the years since, we've cut emissions from county fleet and county buildings by 57%. We passed rules to reduce diesel pollution on all county and city construction sites. We adopted a wood smoke ordinance that has been shown to actually change behavior and improve our air quality while protecting cultural practices such as sweat lodge ceremonies. We championed Cleaner Air Oregon, the first pollution limits in Oregon based on the health of people who live near polluters. And because, we'll clap to that, yeah. And because climate change so gravely threatens our children's future last month, the county became the first government in the nation to stand with the young people suing state and federal governments, demanding real action on climate change. <laughs> At the press conference last month, I listened to Kelsey Juliana, the young woman who has spent half her life on these court cases. I felt our solemn duty to do all we can to tackle our toughest challenges. Kelsey said, the truest form of bravery is recognizing this is the time, now more than ever, to act. I want to recognize all of the young people who are here today to say thank you. Thank you for caring, and please know we stand with you and your generation in these efforts. Let me introduce to you who else is standing in your corner. Commissioner Sharon Myron, our doctor slash lawyer slash commissioner. <laughs> Sharon works to champion physical and mental well being in every one of her fields. Our newest board member, Sushila Jayapal, who is leading our efforts to support refugee and immigrant communities and helping us tackle the ongoing issue of gentrification and displacement. <laughs> Commissioner Jessica Vega-Peterson, who is leading our efforts to build an earthquake-ready Burnside Bridge. She's also organizing the Preschool for All Task Force to help bring education opportunities to children at one of the most crucial times in their lives. And our East County champion, Commissioner Lori Stegman, who is dedicated, she's dedicated to improving service delivery, housing stability, and economic mobility to those neighborhoods. She's also leading our Census 2020 efforts to ensure that every one of us counts. This is a remarkable board. We bring together diverse backgrounds, educations, and perspectives that creates better policy. Just like climate change, we're facing the opioid epidemic head on. A year ago this week, we hosted the first of its kind opioid summit, uniting public safety, healthcare, nonprofit and public health experts with treatment providers, insurers, and first responders. For so long, pharmaceutical companies wanted us to believe that the opioid crisis was a natural disaster. But we know that this is a man-made disaster driven by corporate profits and a criminal enterprise that takes advantage of human vulnerability. We know that opioid dependence can lead to job loss, high health care costs, homelessness, and all too often, death. To give you a sense of how many people in our community have an active substance use disorder, Central City Concern 
estimates about 2,500 people a year who need treatment show up at Hooper Detox. Another 1,000 people show up in emergency departments after they've overdosed. And more than 10,000 people who need treatment are booked into the Multnomah County jails every year. That's an average of 27 people a day. But we are taking action. First, we went upstream, changing our prescribing guidelines for our community health systems and for our own clinics. And I'm proud to say that Multnomah County dentists have cut opioid prescriptions by 80%. We partnered with Sheriff Mike Reese and District Attorney Rod Underhill to support jail diversion and alternative sentences so that people charged with low-level drug crimes can access treatment and have those charges reduced or eliminated. We want people on a path to recovery, not to jail. We desperately need more state and federal money to get more people into treatment. But while we keep hammering away in Salem and in Washington, D.C., we also keep acting locally. We're leading a region, regional partnership with Metro, TriMet, Downtown Clean and Safe, and the City of Portland to get used syringes out of our parks and off our streets by providing convenient syringe disposal throughout the community. And we're holding Big Pharma accountable. We filed suit against the pharmaceutical companies to recover some of the terrible costs of this epidemic because we've learned that our legal strategies make a difference. Just last month, under County Attorney Jenny Madcor, we stopped the Trump administration from unlawfully pulling money from effective and evidence-based teen prevent pregnancy prevention programs and spending it on unproven abstinence-only programs. This win guarantees that our health department and community partners can provide young people in Multnomah County with the health education and skill building they need to reach their life goals. Because our students deserve to be taught reproductive health based on science, not wishful thinking. From direct clinical services and health education to policy, advocacy, and enforcement, the health department's work is vital to Multnomah County's core mission. So I want to thank health department leaders, Vanetta Abdulatif, Wendy Lear, and our fabulous new health department director, Dr. Patricia Charles Heathers. <laughs> Along with hundreds of other employees, they have been crammed into an undersized, technically obsolete 1923 department store. What always worried me was that if we ever had a public health emergency, the command post to respond was housed on the 10th floor of that seismically challenged building. For more than a decade, we wanted to get out of there, but we had nowhere to go and no money to get there. But with the vision, partnerships with the city of Portland and Prosper Portland, and a lot of hard work, on March 20th, we opened an elegant, safe, and energy efficient building designed, constructed, and furnished for a 21st century workforce. The fabulous new nine-story Gladys McCoy Health Department headquarters in Old Town was also completed on time and on budget. <laughs> With that same grit, we're building a new seismically strong 17th story central courthouse at the west end of the Hawthorne Bridge. And it is an absolute thrill to see that project blazing with lights as crews are working 24 seven. These are once in a lifetime projects between the health headquarters and the central courthouse and will always be my baby, the, the Selwood Bridge, We've invested more than yay. <laughs> We've invested more than 750 million dollars in new construction in this community, creating beacons of health, safety and justice, but also thousands of family wage jobs. Because at Multnomah County, it's not just what we're building, it's how we're building. 
Over the last year, labor unions, subcontractors, and day laborers brought concerns to me about workers on construction sites being shorted on their pay. Sometimes their jobs weren't properly classified or their timesheets not properly kept. And it happens across the industry on private and public projects. Wage theft is a little discussed issue that hurts our community by underpaying workers and undercutting honest contractors. Today I'm announcing a fair pay initiative to prevent wage theft on county construction sites. We will provide technical assistance to contractors so they can properly classify and pay their workers, make sure workers know their rights, and train volunteers to help us verify our certified payroll. And I'm excited that we are working together to ensure everyone gets full and fair pay for their work. I know that our development projects can make a big difference in people's lives. We are committed to knocking down barriers to job opportunities in the trades and holding ourselves accountable to doing it. We use labor agreements on both the health headquarters and the courthouse to partner with contractors, trade unions, pre-apprenticeship organizations, and equity stakeholders to create unprecedented job opportunities for women and minorities. The result? Apprentices worked 31% of the total hours on the health headquarters, and 28% of the contractors or subcontractors were women, minority, emerging, or disabled veteran-owned businesses. I'm proud that these public projects are changing the Portland skyline, but I am most proud that they're changing lives. I'd like to introduce Heather Mather Perez and Sean Story, who will tell you what working on our central courthouse has meant for them. For me, with this project, being able to see it come full circle. Usually, once the concrete is done, we're out of there. We've been doing you know, other smaller projects within the building and being able to see the windows put in, paint going on the walls, being a part of changing Portland skyline, that's pretty amazing to me. The courthouse project is what's getting me grounded. It's what's getting me started towards everything because being able to just to work on one project for that long, oh yeah, that gets you comfortable. That gives you that much time to learn that much more of that specific area of the, of the trade itself. This miraculous thing happened. It's the only time I get emotional. But um, I had a surprise pregnancy with triplets and uh, it was exciting but really terrifying because um, how was I gonna support them? So, um, I worked literally until the day uh, before I went into the hospital. I was home with them for the first two years. Daycare was so much money, it was more than I made working. And I was actually sitting in a DHS office um, trying to figure out how to go back to school and you know whether or not they would pay for my daycare. And on the wall there was an um, Oregon Tradeswoman flyer. It was, was life-changing in retrospect. I gave them a call. Um, I enrolled in their seven-week uh, pre-apprenticeship program. I went back to my caseworker, and I said, look, I can't afford daycare. And she said, if it's a pre-apprenticeship program, we'll pay for daycare. A child with a disorder, like, they don't understand everything that a, the average child is gonna get and understand. You gotta, you gotta be patient. She definitely has sensory issues. She's four years old and she just started saying like three word sentences. But now, there's more talking. The good thing about working in a, um, in a construction trade is there are companies that have round the clock hours, but in the trade that I am in, in masonry, for the most part, most of the work is done during the daytime and generally, they try to get done before three o'clock at the latest. 
I've missed so much of my children's lives just because I work so much. It's funny because I'm actually home before they're home now. So where I'm home before they're, they're there, oh, it's a giant difference. I actually get to sit down with them and like you can color, draw. Usually I'm the only woman on a concrete project. So being here at the courthouse was, you're kind of taken aback. Every morning you get on the Alamac, you know, it's like the elevator that takes us to all the floors. You get on there and there are all of these tradeswomen and you're just like, hey, good morning, what's up? Being there 18 months, that work has allowed me to buy my home. It has allowed to pay for the enormous daycare bills we get every month. It's a great program. I think the, the problem is that a lot of people, they are not aware of like fields like that. They, they're, they're, just, they're just not open to it, because I, I mean, I had no idea. If I would've known about it when I was younger, oh, I would've jumped on it. They wanna be builders. You know, it changes every week. One of them wants to master jujitsu. Another one wants to be a gymnast. Another one this week still wants to be a carpenter. My husband brought them to the project one day and they wanted to see those columns because I had nightmares about those columns. They wanted to see what, what it was that stressed me out and made me so happy in the end. And they, they were just in awe. They were so excited and they were like, we can do this. It's a lifelong career and uh, very rewarding to journey out on the courthouse project. It was, it's pretty awesome. We have both Sean and Heather here today. Thank you so much for sharing your stories with us. On January 2nd, like 6,000 other county employees, I opened my laptop and found a new little W on my computer screen. This modest icon was the signal that we had successfully moved all the human resources and financial functions of our $2 billion organization out of the 1990s and into the cloud. This effort, called Moltco Align, has modernized our systems from payroll to purchasing. To give you an example, every year Multnomah County in issues more than 1,000 contracts worth more than $260 million. Before this change, employees managed these contracts by hand, using the phone, email, and yes, sticky notes, to track, edit, and get approvals. Moltco Alliance automates, streamlines, and strengthens these systems. Now a business can sign up with us as a supplier, and we can easily find them, hire them, and more effectively manage them, reminding them to update insurance documents or submit progress reports. I want to thank our Chief Operating Officer, Marisa Madrigal, and Bob Leak, the Interim Director of County Assets, Chief Financial Officer, Mark Campbell, Budget Director, Mike Jaspin, and Chief Human Resources Officer, Travis Graves, for their leadership in transforming our ability to serve our community. We owe so much to our Chief Financial Officer, Mark Campbell. He's retiring on May 1st, 30 years to the day that he started at the county. I want to publicly thank him for his conservative approach. Conservative approach, I bet you never thought you'd hear me say that. <laughs> and I want to welcome the man who's been working side by side with Mark for years now, our new CFO, Eric Ariano. Turning a ship as large and complex as Multnomah County is a massive undertaking, but we must tackle these long overdue issues for the benefit of this community and the health and sustainability of this organization. We have one of the busiest and the best library systems in the country, but the last time we invested in library spaces was in the late 1990s, when our community was daydreaming about a max line to the airport. Two years ago, the board approved a vision to modernize our library spaces, and the library staff have been doing that analysis, looking at sites, 
talking to potential partners, and I am looking forward later this year to moving that plan forward. Our technological and physical infrastructure matters, but our people matter more. Our hiring and promotion practices matter. Our training and accountability for our managers matter. Our employee experience matters. And that's what workforce equity is all about. When people come to the county for services, they expect and deserve compassion, equitable treatment, and results, especially when they're in crisis. The only way we can meet those expectations is through the dedication of our county employees. To do that, our employees must also experience respect, support, compassion, and inclusion where they work. In the last year, county employees shared painful, personal stories of the racism and discrimination they have faced on the job. Our own data showed clear disparities in promotions and terminations. Multnomah County has worked hard over the last decade to attract and retain a workforce that looks like the community that we serve. But we hadn't addressed the underlying institutional racism and inequities on which this organization and our entire nation was built. Systems designed by white people to benefit white people like me. It's been humbling. It's been necessary to listen and learn from county employees and to leverage my position and privilege to champion this initiative and to support their leadership. I want to take a moment to publicly thank the employee resource groups at Multnomah County. We rooted our workforce equity initiative in the experiences of our employees of color, our managers of color, immigrants and refugees, employees with disabilities, LGBTQ employees, families, veterans, and older adults. We hired national consultants and adopted recommendations for systemic and structural change. We asked our employees to prioritize those recommendations, and as a result, we're creating an independent unit to manage discrimination complaints. We're building a new training, coaching, and evaluation structure for our 800 managers. And we're leading with race. Poverty, homelessness, substance abuse disorders, and justice involvement affect many marginalized groups. But race is the magnifying effect across all areas. Leading with race allows us to understand the greatest challenges and to focus on where we can make the biggest difference. We are transforming this organization, and that helps transform this community. As we work to improve our internal structures, practices, and policies, we are also continuing our efforts to adapt our services to meet the needs of our diverse and changing community. This year, our county human services team under Director Peggy Bray launched Data Mart, which allowed us to identify people who, because of age or a disability, need help in an emergency. Our team created a map of more than 120,000 people with case management and contact information. So when the water main broke in Northeast Portland last month, we were able to reach 197 impacted clients. And during the Cully Auto Salvage Yard fire, we reached 2,500 people to help them evacuate and offer them services. Having innovative and equity-driven initiatives is important, but building a program from the ground up that is creative, culturally fluent, and leading with race, that is a game changer. And nowhere is that more obvious than the Diane Wade House. Like almost every other community in our country, Multnomah County and its voters were caught up in the mass incarceration frenzy of the last several decades. Tens of thousands of people were jailed in what turned out to be a not-so-effective strategy, and one that came with a devastating cost for our communities and our county budget. The county has been working for years to turn this tide, and we've done a lot, cutting our use of jail beds 27% in the last decade. <laughs> Recently, we received funding from the MacArthur Foundation to go even further because we know that jail is the most expensive and least effective place to house someone with an untreated mental health or substance use disorder. 
we are still jailing far too many people. And we are still jailing too many people of color. African Americans make up just 6% of this community, but 20% of our jail population. That cannot continue. If we want to change our outcomes, we have to change the way we do this work, how we design it, how we lead it, and how we support it. So we are trying something new. On Wednesday, we opened an Afrocentric transitional housing program for adult women involved in the criminal justice system. The Diane Way House was created by black women for black women. These are all women whose personal journeys show others that a different future is possible. Women like Latoya Manlove, a Bridges to Change staff member working at the Diane Wade House, her story gives us all hope. It's love and compassion and just uplifting. Our lives are like the hope that they can have. You know, if they see that we can, that we did it, you know, and it's not even been that long since I was out there, you know. So if they, they can see that, that we have done it, then they can do it, you know. I was born and raised um, in Portland. Uh, went to Catholic schools growing up. My mom passed in 2001, and I took that really hard. I went through a real grieving process that I was in a lot of anger for a long time, like shock. Like right after she passed, I got into like this relationship and it was like, it wasn't healthy at all. And um, so that's where the criminal history comes from. My youngest son, I haven't seen it in four years. And so um, since I've been clean, uh, he came and visited last summer for a month. Yeah. So out of three years, that was my first time seeing my son. And I think a lot of my issues came from um, just um, not dealing with myself, you know. All of my al alcohol and uh, my addiction problems was because I hadn't dealt with myself. Having people that's been through um, what you've been through, it plays a big part, you know, because they, they, um, they have empathy and they just know, like, where you are. And then being with people that look like you and they understand your mannerisms and they're not, like, afraid. And I think that's what works, like, here. It's a spiritual place also, you know, so the women, they play their music and we pray, I pray. <laughs> so it just makes the house more peaceful. I felt like I was misunderstood a lot, you know, but I'm not a bad, I was never a bad person. I can see that in, in the women coming in, you know, they're loving women, you know, and um, we get to see that side of them. Thank you, LaToya. You are an inspiration to all of us. Like every member of our board, I am a mother. And as much as I sometimes complain about them, Alexander, Jacob, and Anna are my heart and my life's work. So I will never accept that children are growing up in our community without a place to call home. When I learned families who lost their homes in the recession were living in cars, I pushed to open a winter shelter for families. When I saw kids sitting outside that shelter, doing their homework in the freezing rain, waiting for the doors to open at night, I directed staff to open a 24-hour shelter for families. But the truth is, these families need more than living in a large room with 120 bunks. They need their personal space. Every family does. Especially when the Portland housing market is keeping families in shelters longer than ever. The market here is so tight that families are stuck in shelter even when they have a housing voucher 
even when they have a full-time job. So I am thrilled to announce that by this summer, we will have transformed our year-round family shelter system into one where every family has the dignity of their own space. By June, in partnership with Human Solutions, we will have personal spaces for 40 families at Lilac Meadows, a master leased motel that will be modified to provide a full range of support services. Shelters keep people safe, but they don't end homelessness. Permanent housing ends homelessness. So we're in the midst of revisioning our entire shelter system so that people get what they need to get into permanent housing and stay there. This summer, we're opening a shelter on Foster Road that will include not just beds, a kitchen, and laundry, but also classrooms, computers, and case managers. We've partnered with the business community to make this happen downtown as well at the soon-to-open Navigation Center. I want to thank the business community and particularly Columbia Sportswear CEO Tim Boyle for his generous contribution. But let's be honest, opening a shelter is never easy. In fact, it can be fraught, especially for some of the neighbors. So I want to thank community members who welcomed our shelter on 122nd with a party. Their compassion brought businesses, the families in the neighborhood, and the men at the Y East shelter together to eat, play games, and to build community. Caleb Coder, John Haynes, and Sven Gachev, thank you for seeing that people without housing are our neighbors. We don't have to wait for them to become housed to treat them that way. And I am proud and grateful to work with Mark Jolin, Mayor Ted Wheeler, Mayor Shane Bemis, Home Forward, and all of our partners in A Home for Everyone on these efforts. We came together in a crisis, but that crisis isn't over. Echo Northwest recently reported that there are at least 56,000 households in our region who spend more than half of their income on rent. That's a razor's edge that can turn a single missed paycheck or an illness into catastrophe. So while we fix, seek long-term fixes, we are constantly pivoting to keep people in their homes. Like the seniors on fixed incomes who lived in apartments at the Lincoln Hotel downtown. They had lived there for decades, thinking it was the last home they'd ever have until their building sold last month. But with the help from Care Oregon, we were able to pool $100,000 to help residents relocate without ever going into shelter or on the streets. Because once someone loses their home, it becomes much, much harder to find another home, to stay healthy, or even to stay alive. Last December, on the longest and darkest night of the year, the winter solstice, I walked with about 70 other people from St. Mark's Lutheran Church on Powell to our planned shelter on Foster Road. It was bitter cold. We lit candles, and as the bell tolled, we listened to the names of those who had died on our streets. When the list ended, people started calling out names of others who had been lost, and there were so many names. The only way we're gonna save lives in this community and end homelessness is with housing. That doesn't mean it's the only thing we have to do for people in a housing crisis, but it is the most important thing we have to do. With the city of Portland, we've committed to, to creating 2,000 new supportive housing units these are homes that come with mental health and addiction services. And so far, we have more than 600 of these new homes up or in the pipeline because some people need more than just a key to the front door to end their homelessness. There is one major piece that has eluded us for years. We have had very few options for people downtown experiencing mental health issues. When people leave the Unity Center or lose their housing, the only choices that we have had are the least effective and the most expensive ones, the emergency room or, more often, the county jail. That is until Monday. On Monday, I am delighted to say that Multnomah County purchased what was known as the Bouchong Building in downtown Portland that will become a safe haven for people experiencing mental health challenges on our streets. Our vision is to create a safe place 
where people can come inside, get a peaceful night's rest, a place to wash their clothes, and most importantly, support from a community of people who know exactly what they're going through because they've been there too. Some people might need to stay just a few hours, some might need a few weeks, but they will get the help that they have never been able to get before, and that is a pretty awesome thing. about you, but some days I feel like I'm trapped in this 24-hour news cycle nightmare. Mass shootings, despair at the border, another catastrophic flood, and a president telling us that we can't or don't need to solve these problems. It's really tempting to turn on each other instead of coming together. But I've seen the power of our community nonprofits and our business partners collaborating. I've seen what our cities and the county can accomplish when we cooperate. And I would ask each of you to join with me in believing that together we can create a more equitable, just, and healthy community. I know that a better world is possible because every day I watch 6,000 county employees face the most complex and serious problems of our time with courage, creativity, and heart. I want to thank every single one of you for that. It is an honor to serve with you. Thank you. Our radio audience, this is City Club of Portland's Friday Forum. I'm Lisa Watson, past president of City Club, and we're here today with Multnomah County Chair Deborah Kafori. We have about 10 minutes for some audience questions. Our microphone is to your right, our left. Uh, if you've written a question on an index card, please hold it high now for City Club staff to collect, and you can also submit questions via Twitter using the hashtag Friday Forum. Civic scholars from Roosevelt High School are here with us today, as we mentioned earlier. Please make space for one of the students to ask the first question at the microphone. And to City Club members who would like to ask a question at the mic, please identify yourself as a City Club member and then ask one question in 30 seconds or less. Thank you. Does this mean I don't have to answer the question? <laughs> I think we need to do some fundraising to buy the City Club a new podium <laughs> with microphone. Does anybody want to chip into this effort? Waiting for a civic, waiting for a civic scholar to come up. But in the meantime, uh, Ted Kay, City Club member, would you discuss earthquake preparedness by Multnomah County beyond earthquake proofing the Burnside Bridge? Thank you. The, the Burnside Bridge earthquake preparedness is a crucial piece of our efforts. Um, it is the lifeline, so if there's an if and when Cascadia happens, we will need to have emergency vehicles be able to connect the east and west sides of our community. Um, the, in other areas, as I mentioned earlier, with the Data Mart system, that is exactly what, what it's for. So in case of an emergency, we are able to connect with the most vulnerable members of our community, seniors who are isolated, people with disabilities who don't have, <laughs> who don't have an ability to leave their homes. We have an amazing team. Thank you. I kind of like that one. We have an amazing team in emergency management led by Chris Voss in the back over there, and they're working uh, tirelessly to make sure that we are prepared for when the big one hits. 
Hi, next question. <laughs> All right. uh, hi there. My name is Jaime. I'm part of Civic Scholars from Roosevelt. And my question is, um, how is the county helping the middle class grow rather than diminish it? I'm sorry, I couldn't, I couldn't hear what you said. Oh, how is the county helping the middle class grow rather than diminish it? Oh, that's a really great question. Um, one of the important things that we've seen in our community is that this housing crisis is not just affecting people who have little or no income, it's affecting um, middle class Portlanders and, and Multnomah County residents as well. And I think that unless you have a stable place to call home, you're not able to do much of anything else. So that is the first way that we try to help people is by making sure that they have a place to call home. And thank you for your work. Congratulations on graduating this year from Roosevelt High School. Uh, hi, Chair Kafori, Ashley Henry, City Club member and uh, Chair of Business for a Better Portland. You mentioned uh, the donations that were made uh, to support one of the shelters, and I was wondering if you could comment on what the business can do, business community can do in addition to philanthropy to address homelessness. Are there any particular policies that are under consideration right now in Salem that would be helpful uh, for the business community to support? Um, there are always policies uh, that are occurring in Salem. Um, I think one of the areas that was highlighted in the Echo Northwest recent study where they looked at what's happening in Multnomah County and how we're addressing the homelessness crisis. And what they found, um, and this is a highly respected um, economic firm, what they found was that we are doing the right things here. The things that we're doing to address homelessness and housing insecurity are working giving people rent subsidies, helping people get rapidly rehoused back into, into permanent housing. Everything we're doing is working. We just need to do more of it. We need to scale up. So there is a group of business leaders, faith leaders, philanthropic leaders, and community members who have come together in a group called Here Together. And I would um, encourage you all to Google that, to look up, to join this organization, this effort, to work to make sure that we have the funding that we need to continue to do what we're doing and may take it one step further. Thanks, Ashley. Uh, we have one question from Twitter. Um, I'm not gonna read it verbatim, it's really short, but I think I get the gist. Um, the person is saying, can we now update city government and time, is it time to merge city and county? <laughs> <laughs> Um, let's see, where do I start with that one? <laughs> I actually believe that it's six of one, half dozen of another. I mean, we could spend a lot of time and energy merging the city and county government, but it's not just the city. We have other cities. We have Gresham, Troutdale, Wood Village, Fairview. I'm not sure how they would feel about merging with the city of Portland and Multnomah <laughs> County. I think it'd be a huge undertaking. That being said, I think the voters should get a chance to vote on what they want the city of Portland government to look like. I think it is time to put something on the ballot to change the structure of the city government. Do you have a question? One more question. Hi, Bobby. Hi, Bobby Regan from City Club. Uh, the state legislature is about halfway through their session at this time. And I was curious from a county perspective what the top one or two priorities you have for the state legislature this year. We have, yes, we have a very uh, strong legislative agenda led by our fabulous team of government relations over there, yay team. Uh, our, we, I would say the top priorities are definitely getting more funding for behavioral health services. Um, people spend a lot of time critiquing our system and criticizing what's happening, but it is a sorely underfunded system. We have some amazing programs, like the Stabilization Treatment Program that we partner with Central City Concern on. It takes people who have mental health issues, coming out of the criminal justice system gives them housing, gives them the, the stability that they need. We could put a lot more people through that program if we had the funding. The legislature very thankfully did give us some money during the last um, emergency board meeting. 
we need more. We need more of these programs across our community. We need funding for the new Bouchong building that I mentioned earlier, that program. So contact your legislators and tell them that they need to ad adequately fund behavioral health services in our state. Well, our time is up and we'll have to pause the conversation for now. Please join me in thanking Mary Margaret Wheeler Weber and Bobby Regan for producing today's program as well as... <laughs> as well as our sponsors, Kaiser Permanente, J.E. Dunn Construction and Wells Fargo. Thank you for your support of City Club and the Civic Scholars from Roosevelt High School. Thank you for being here and for coming downtown to join us. And of course, Chair Kafori for sharing your vision for Multnomah County. Thank you. Thank you. We're adjourned.